I have received a letter from the First Minister, the Right Honourable Peter Robinson, notifying me of his resignation under Section 16B of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, with effect from the 11th of January 2016. Mr Robinson also sought leave to make a statement, and I will call him shortly. However, before doing so, I am sure that all members would want me to convey the Assembly's best wishes to him as he leaves the office of First Minister and would wish to recognise his long years of public service. I call the Right Honourable Mr Peter Robinson. Mr Robinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am grateful for the opportunity to make this statement. It is uh, typical of the fairness and courtesy that you have demonstrated during your time in office that you provided me with this opportunity and made all of the necessary arrangements. I can assure you that I do not intend to trespass on your generosity by speaking too long. Mr Speaker, it has been a great privilege to serve the people of Northern Ireland for almost 40 years, with nearly eight of those years being as First Minister. In this Assembly, we have had our share of trials and ordeals, but through them all we have emerged much stronger. Every new institution composed of politicians who have known nothing other than being in opposition will have a learning curve while members mature, develop and adapt to taking responsibility, and while the more sensible ones adjust their ambitions to fit the politics of what, with effort, is achievable. Crucially, after centuries of division, we had to outlive the growing pains of learning to work together, fashion shared policies, and create a more inclusive society. It is a feature of every societal transformation that some will be displeased at the pace of change, some believing it to be too fast and others feeling it is too slow. Yet so much has been achieved and the platform now exists to do even more. Politics, by its very nature, is a combative endeavour, and we don't always take time to recognise the role that others play. I differ with some in this House on many issues, but in my long experience in politics, there are very few who are not well motivated and who do not act in the best interests of society as they themselves see it. In whatever capacity they serve, I admire those who devote their lives to public service. When we take a step back and with the perspective of history, we can see just how far we have come because we now live in a new era. You only have to look around you to see the progress that there has been, not just in the physical structures that it didn't exist a decade ago, but in the lives of our people. Though we don't always fully appreciate it, devolution underpins a level of peace and stability that we enjoy today. After 35 years of stop-go government, devolution with local people taking the decisions is once again the norm. That has allowed us the platform to recast Northern Ireland's international image and to bring in more jobs than at any point in our history. Whereas once tourists avoided coming here, we are now attract people from right across the globe. We not only provided for partnership government, but we agreed the devolution of policing and justice functions. In recent months, we have resolved the welfare reform issue and put the Assembly's finances back on a stable footing. We have secured the devolution of corporation tax and agreed a rate and a date for commencement. We have agreed significant reforms to the way government operates, with a reduction in the number of departments and assembly members and the creation of an official opposition. In politics, there is never a full stop, and much remains to be done, but I believe that this is the right moment for me to step aside and to hand over the burden and the privilege of office. Dealing with the legacy of the past is a work in progress, and reconciliation will be an ongoing enterprise, but even here, real progress has been made. The foundations have been laid, and it will be for others to continue building. It would be remiss of me not to thank the Deputy First Minister and all of those I have served alongside in the Executive over these past years. Through good times and bad, we have worked together despite our many differences in background, temperament and outlook. 
Strangely, we were at our strongest when the threat from outside the political institutions was at its greatest. The collective revulsion across the community and across this chamber following the murders of sappers Mark Quincy and Patrick Azamkar, as well as Constable Stephen Carroll and Ronan Kerr, was the surest sign to me that we were never going to go back to the dark days of the past. I thank my party colleagues for the opportunities they have given me, and I wish all of them well for the future. I am absolutely certain that in Arling I have a worthy successor. I can assure her that I will not interfere in her work, but if she ever needs a word of encouragement or advice, I will always be there to offer it. Mr. Speaker, consistent with the terms of my letter of last Monday, I hereby resign the office of First Minister with confidence that the political institutions we have together created will be here for generations to come. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you. And I would remind the House of the Convention that where a minister is making a statement on his resignation, there will be an opportunity for others to comment afterwards. How this is managed is at my discretion, and in order to be as fair and inclusive as possible, I have decided to adopt the procedure regularly used for matters of the day. I am allocating the next 30 minutes for others to speak, and I ask members to limit their remarks to not more than three minutes. And uh, just, just by word of, of uh, a, a personal perspective on that, uh, can I also add my congratulations to, uh, to the contribution that you've made to our community over many, many years. Uh, I do think that those comments are, uh, will be recognized as being uh, absolutely fair and a recognition of the sacrifice and the commitment. And I think at times like this, uh, you know, I think it's important that the, uh, the chamber, which is an arena for debate and very robust debate, that we also can demonstrate that, uh, that we can recognize with uh, magnanimity the, uh, the sacrifice that is involved in, uh, in taking on public office and particularly holding high office. Uh, and today is such a, such a day. And for that reason, uh, I am only pleased, only too pleased as the speaker to give you all an opportunity to uh, put your own comments on the record. And can I begin by calling Ms. Arlene Foster. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm delighted that after yourself I am the first uh, to have the opportunity to pay tribute to Peter and to thank him for his lifetime uh, in politics from Castlereagh Council via Westminster to the Assembly. He leaves enormous political shoes to fill. Three minutes cannot do justice to the career of the person who has been the most astute unionist political leader of this or for that matter, any era in Northern Ireland's history. But when the history of this time comes to be written, his leadership will define this period. In his time, he has helped redraw the unionist political map and ensured a better future for Northern Ireland in the most challenging of circumstances. Few have endured more difficult political times and come out the other side successfully. Few will ever know or indeed fully appreciate the lifetime of service and single-minded commitment that Peter has brought to public life. He has been a leader not just of the DUP, but of unionism uh, and indeed of Northern Ireland as a whole. It is a daunting task for me to follow him in not just one, but two of those roles. There are many who will deservedly share the credit for the Northern Ireland we have now, but few more so than Peter Robinson. His legacy is not just that he became First Minister, but that he ensured that devolution survived the early rocky years. It is because of Peter's work that what was remarkable at one time now seems routine. Few believed that devolution led by the DUP and Sinn Féin would ever happen. Fewer believed that it would last, yet it has, even through the toughest of times. For every era in history, someone is called upon to fulfil the role of leadership. Never in the recent history of Northern Ireland was anyone so crucial than Peter Robinson. On a personal note, I would not have the chance that I have, but for the work of Peter. First of all, encouraging me to join the DUP, 
then for helping me through the ranks of the party, and lastly, providing me with the opportunity to serve the people of Northern Ireland as a minister. I will always be grateful for that. More th than all of that, he has been a political mentor to me. I have watched and listened at close hand, and I hope that even a little of his insight has rubbed off on me. Mr. Speaker, I am certain that at critical moments over this last seven, nearly eight years, there was no other unionist leader that could have held things together and ensured that devolution proceeded. Peter was never better than in a crisis and on more than one occasion did not simply survive difficult events but prospered from them. It was almost as if he reveled in adversity and thrived in the face of impossible odds. At a political level, the return of 38 DUP MLAs was a remarkable achievement to exceed the result of 2007 and elect more MLAs than any party has since 1998 was truly historic. In recent decades, few unionist leaders have been able to choose the time and manner of their departure from office. Peter has done so and leaves office with both devolution and the union secure. Peter Robinson would have been a significant political figure no matter where he was born on these islands. It has been our collective good fortune and to Northern Ireland's benefit that he was born here. Finally, and I know I speak for all on these benches when I wish Peter well in his retirement, though I'm quite certain that he will not be putting his feet up uh, just quite yet. He can enjoy his well-deserved retirement and the knowledge that when his time came to serve his country and his community, he was not found wanting and leaves behind him a far better Northern Ireland because of his work. Peter, we will never adequately be able to thank you for the service that you have given. We can only strive to build on your strong leadership that you have given to us. You said late last year that listening to tributes to oneself was surreal uh, and you were still very much alive. Well, I hope that you enjoy listening to what we have to say today because nobody, nobody deserves the plaudits more than you. Have the names of some members who have already indicated that they wish to speak, but could I ask all members who would like to contribute to continue to raise in their places, and I will endeavour to accommodate as many as possible. And of course, the briefer you are, the more opportunity there will be for others. Could I call Mr. Martin McGuinness? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I too rise to uh, express uh, my deep appreciation for the leadership that has been shown uh, by Peter Robinson, particularly over the course of the last uh, eight years. It, it's no secret that we first met uh, during the course of that famous weekend in March 2007 in Stormont Castle. I, I was accompanied by Jerry Kelly and Conor Murphy, Peter by Nigel Dodds and by Ian Paisley Jr. And of course, the outcome of uh, that engagement, uh, during which we uh, agreed every single word, dot and comma, that both Ian Paisley and Jerry Adams would say the following Monday, a statement which confounded the world's media, thinking they were here to proclaim another failure within the peace process. Uh, and as a result of that, I spent uh, one year in the office of First and Deputy First Minister uh, with Ian Paisley. And incredibly, despite our different uh, ideological outlooks, our different allegiances, Ian Paisley and I developed a positive working relationship. And just as importantly, a friendship that existed until the day he died. And I very much treasure that friendship, both with Ian and with his wife Eileen and the Paisley family. Peter took over in 2008, and uh, one of the first conversations that we had, uh, Peter said to me that no matter what happened on the streets, we must ensure that these institutions do not collapse. And we were mindful that the institutions had collapsed on several previous occasions, albeit under other political parties. And during the course of our stewardship of the Office of First and Deputy First Minister, we faced many huge challenges, not least the challenge of those who would try to plunge us back to the past. 
uh, those so-called dissident Republicans who murdered uh, the young soldiers, uh, Mark Quincy and uh, Patrick Asenkiar at Antrim, uh, those people who killed uh, Constable Stephen Carroll and Ronan Kerr, and prison officer David Black. We also face huge pressure from the extremes of loyalism in terms of the reaction to the decision taken at Belfast City Council on flags, and of course the situation at Ardoin. Uh, without uh, dwelling on or mentioning the pressures that were imposed upon our executive by an austerity agenda that was coming from the Tories in Westminster. But during all of that period, against the backdrop of a world economic downturn, uh, the work that we did with Ian Paisley, the work that I did with Peter in terms of our regular visits to the United States paid huge dividends in terms of foreign direct investment, the provision of jobs for our people, and even at a time of economic downturn, we had a situation where uh, we were able to uh, buck the trend in terms of investment and uh, find ourselves in a position to deliver for uh, the citizens uh, that we represented. So I want to pay tribute to the leadership that Peter showed uh, from that first engagement right through. Uh, we faced many challenges, uh, many difficulties, but I think we came through in the end. And as I said, uh, and I want to say lastly, uh, I had a friendship with uh, Ian Paisley that existed until the day he dies. I have no doubt I have a friendship with Peter which will exist until the day we both die. Thank you. Thank you. And the comments of Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, my political career doesn't go back decades, along with uh, uh, the First Ministers, but uh, we have come from different places and have been in different sides of uh, different arguments. Uh, and I understand uh, very much, and many people in this and everybody in this chamber understands the commitment that uh, it takes to be a full-time political representative, uh, the toll that takes on, on your family, uh, and the toll that that takes on you uh, personally. And uh, you know, I, I have no difficulty recognising the effort and commitment that uh, Peter Robinson has given uh, to Northern Ireland and to the people that he represents. He's a formidable uh, political character, uh, obviously a capable. Uh, strategist and party builder, and somebody with a tremendous uh, work rate. Uh, maybe not the best diet uh, in the world, but uh, a, a tremendous work rate all, all, all the same. Uh, I think it has to be said, Mr. Speaker, that after I think years of of rejecting what we would have seen as possible solutions to the problems here, um, Peter Robinson has, uh, in terms of unionism's commitment uh, to these institutions, has cemented uh, that commitment. Has ensured. Uh, that we do have, uh, I think, lasting institutions uh, in this part of the world. The SDLP has long argued and long struggled for uh, these types of institutions to be created. And it has to be said, whether we might disagree on how they've evolved or how they've delivered, it is clear that Peter Robinson's commitment and leadership has ensured uh, that I think that these institutions will survive uh, the test of time as they have over the last number of years. And I just want to end by wishing him a very uh, long and happy uh, retirement, and I hope he gets the time uh, to enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. And a call, Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Um, the last time I was uh, in Mr. Robinson's company was sadly uh, at Roselawn uh, over Christmas at the funeral uh, of Liam Clark, uh, the journalist. Uh, and the order of service focused on, on the words Liam wrote when he realized he was terminally ill. Uh, and those words encouraged us uh, to think about the importance of personal relationships uh, rather than on uh, winning arguments. And I think that will be uh, my theme because, after all, three minutes wouldn't do justice uh, to the number of disputes between the DUP uh, and the Ulster Unionists down the year. So I'll stick to, to interpersonal relationships. And I have known Mr. Robinson uh, for what seems like a very long time. Uh, as a journalist, uh, one of the first interviews I remember was in uh, 1988. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Robinson remembers, but he was just back from Duisburg, uh, a German city, uh, where he had been involved in secret talks uh, with ourselves, the Alliance, uh, and the SDLP. And the BBC gave me three minutes uh, to get the lowdown of what he'd been up to. He wouldn't even tell me what the weather had been like. It's seven degrees and drizzly uh, currently. And of course, 
the 10th of October 2002 in the UTV studios when I sat between Peter Robinson and Martin McGuinness as they engaged with each other for the first time ever. Uh, as it said in the newsletter, McGuinness, Robinson, uh, in studio war, the picture you never thought you would see. Uh, who knew then uh, that it would end as it does now? Uh, more recently, Mr. Speaker, of course, I've developed a relationship with the First Minister uh, politically, uh, not least cooperating uh, in the, in the uh, general election of 2015, ensuring uh, that we returned to the position again where the majority of our 18 members of Parliament are pro-union. Uh, that cooperation uh, most keenly seen and evidenced in Fermanagh and South Tyrone. Uh, Mr. Robinson has been around uh, the DUP a very, very long time, so it is perhaps surprising uh, to remember that he only ever led the DUP into one assembly election, but as Mrs. Foster said, an incredibly successful one. Uh, and I'm sure, at least privately, a, a part of Mr. Robinson uh, will join with me in hoping that history reflects that that was the peak of the DUP's uh, electoral successes. <laughs> and so let me, <laughs> let me wish Mr. Robinson and his family a healthy uh, and a prosperous future. Okay, good wishes and wishful thinking. Um, I call Mr. David Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can, can, can I try to get away from the party politics a little and, and just express some good wishes to Peter Robinson from my colleagues? Um, I certainly am a few years older than Colm Eastwood, but I do recall the fact that when I became involved in full-time politics as General Secretary of the Alliance Party, Peter Robinson had already been a Member of Parliament for 10 years. It is a measure of an extremely long and very significant career covering very significant events in the life of this region. And during those times, uh, his party and mine have had many disagreements, in fact, probably more disagreements than agreements. But I do want today to recognize his commitment to the political process, the work that he has done. Much of it as deputy uh, to Ian Paisley, but in recent years as the leader in his own right. And there's no doubt that he has played an extremely key role in this institution and in the life of Northern Ireland for many years, but most particularly since the restoration of devolution. He himself mentioned the devolution of justice, and I don't believe that that would have happened without the commitment that he made to ensuring that devolution was fully embedded and was capable of taking on the difficult task of justice, particularly in the light of the tragedies that he has highlighted that we've suffered in recent years. But he had a major role, leaving aside a brief spell in regional development in the First Assembly. He had a major role as Minister of Finance in seeing how matters were put into order for devolution on restoration in 2007. He then had a very significant career as First Minister. And there's no doubt that his efforts, alongside those of the Deputy First Minister, kept these institutions going through some very difficult times, particularly over the last couple of years. He himself referred to, I think he called it, trials and ordeals. But there's no doubt there have been very significant trials and ordeals, which this Assembly has survived, and he played a large part in ensuring that happened. He will presumably regard the Fresh Start announcement before Christmas as being the summit of his work. It will, of course, now be for others to deliver on that so-called fresh start to ensure that we fully embed the principles of moving forward. But there is no doubt that when he talked about the issue of the pace of change, uh, in this corner of the House we were probably seeking a faster pace of change than was always uh, possible elsewhere. Even saying that, I would wish to acknowledge that without his work, we would not have had the solid embedding, the strength of the institutions the strength of the political process against those who would seek to disrupt it and disturb it. And he has played a very significant part in ensuring a better future for all of us. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker um, 
I was first uh, stood first for election in 1977, 40 years uh, ago next year, and in that time I have known uh, Peter Robinson as a colleague and as a friend. Um, we have been uh, we have engaged throughout Northern Ireland in a whole series of political meetings and discussions. Those discussions, as particularly in the 1970s and 1980s and into the early 90s, involved discussions about how we could move uh, the country forward, and they involved going to places such as the United States of America, South Africa, mainland Europe, uh, and elsewhere. And of course, uh, Peter brought to unionism an incisive knowledge and belief that terror had to stop and those who advocate terror had to cease advocating terror. Those who didn't recognize the court had to not just recognize it, but support the courts and the rule of law. And when they did so, anything could be possible. And that was the nub of the difficulty that we had for so many years. But he never shirked the responsibility that he had uh, all those years. We uh, wish you well for the future, Peter. We hope hope that you will not take your retirement too seriously, that you will be available if called upon for advice, but we hope and pray that you will enjoy your retirement, both you and your family, and may God richly bless you for the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. I, I certainly wish to wish the retiring uh, First Minister a long and healthy retirement. Uh, Forty years of a political career uh, in Peter Robinson's case has been quite a remarkable event uh, in that he has scaled many heights and attained much in terms of his ambition. He undoubtedly is, was, and I suspect under another guise will continue to be a very formidable parliamentarian, and his contributions have been very notable. His debating skills uh, in a class of their own, and I think anyone who has encountered him knows that. Uh, he and I, in our early political years, our paths and our policies coincided significantly. In latter years, I suppose you could say, they have diverged emphatically. But I think that the, uh, first, the retiring First Minister and I would probably, from our different perspectives, each of the view that each of us took the wrong road. And in holding that view of each other, I suppose that's something about which we still agree. <laughs> and certainly, a, no one would expect me, uh, I would have thought, a, and if they will, they will be disappointed, to endorse the legacy or embrace the legacy that the retiring First Minister leaves us. A legacy of terrorists in government, of a dysfunctional system which just last year he described as not fit for purpose. Uh, a, a system which gives year after year of failure and disappointment as it has. A system which denies the most elementary of democratic rights, the right to a people to change their government, the right to vote a party out of government. None of that uh, I embrace but continue to oppose. Pinned to my notice board in my office, it may surprise some people to hear, I have a speech of Peter Robinson's. It's a speech of the 8th of May, 2001. And from time to time, I take it down and I read it. And I read it again this morning. And the message of that speech is very clear. It conveyed the grasp that Peter Robinson has 
of Martin McGuinness. That he knows the real Martin McGuinness and all he stands for and all he did. And I would recommend anyone who wants to contrast the earlier career of Mr. Robinson with these latter actions to read that speech. And in that speech, amongst other things, he talks about the unseemly and immoral sham that is Belfast Agreement devolution. I couldn't put it better myself. My only regret is that he ended his career by embracing Belfast Agreement devolution and inflicting us upon it. But that apart, I wish him and his family uh, <laughs> many years of happy retirement and of healthy retirement. Because I think as he has realized, health is very important. And for, for, for that, I'm sure we all join. Mr. Speaker, and I would like to add to the previous congratulations um, from many members uh, to Peter Robinson on what has been a long and distinguished career. Um, as somebody who certainly hopes to be still at the, the beginning of his political career, I, I, I'm certainly not placed to judge um, the achievements of, of Peter Robinson. Others, uh, maybe longer in the tooth and more experienced, will do that, and, and there'll be plenty. I'm sure written about his career, but undoubtedly um, it will be seen as, 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 as successful. That said, um, as an elected member, I, I, I do have the right to, to, to disagree and, and to purport a, a very different political opinion. And, and when Mr. Robinson speaks of the, the pace of change, I, I always say that I'm very proud of how far Northern Ireland has come at the same time as being very frustrated. It hasn't moved further faster. And I do believe the issue of transparency in politics has still a long way to go. And of the many achievements of, of Peter Robinson in this time, I think that's, that's something, a, a legacy that still remains, where there's still suspicion and mistrust around politics because we do not have the levels of transparency um, that exist elsewhere on these islands. On a personal level, I, I would like to, to thank Mr. Robinson when I, I, I sought meetings with him. He, he obliged, and I, I always did appreciate that, knowing the many commitments um, he had. And I do wish him, him good health and, and whatever his future holds um, uh, uh, beyond, uh, after his time in the Assembly. I do wish him good health and happiness um, um, in the future. Thank you. And I call Mr. Jonathan Bell. Speaker, may I begin by saying the sincerest word of thanks to Peter Robinson for the leadership that he gave. Thanks both to him personally and uh, to his family for all the sacrifices that they made over decades of politics to take us to the place we are in Northern Ireland. And if I could just take some of the words of Lord Morrow, our party chairman, a few moments ago, uh, and many of us echoed this both personally and as MLAs and as a political party. Uh, Peter, we owe to you a debt, and Northern Ireland owes to you a debt that we can never repay. Because in Peter Robinson, we had the best strategic thinker of unionism. He used his God-given forensic intelligence for the good of everyone, and I mean everyone, in Northern Ireland. I was at a conference, manufacturing conference recently international at Queen's University. Mm -hmm. They led with a slide that said Belfast is now the second safest city in the world, a United Nations figure slide that said the second safest city in the world. We are second only uh, to Tokyo. As we look at Northern Ireland, have an unemployment about a third less than the European uh, Union average, a healthy unemployment rate, and we compare over the last five years to both the United Kingdom uh, and the Republic of Ireland, an immense interest now in Northern Ireland into the future. We do look to Peter because you, Peter, were a linchpin. You were a foundation in that success. I almost said, Peter, you were a rock, but you were a foundation uh, in that success. We look to the past, a legacy of death when those tried by means of violence to expel us from the United Kingdom. You were a rock against that. And when I look to the present, 
of where we are both socially and economically and in terms of the structures of Northern Ireland Assembly, the hope that we now have going into the future. You were a linchpin in establishing that present. And into the future, you led us the foundations of a Northern Ireland with uh, economic costs about 85 per cent of the rest of the United Kingdom, 95 per cent of the Republic of Ireland, and today able to take round the world a message that Northern Ireland will have the lowest rate of corporation tax in the United Kingdom from the 1st of April 2018. You had a deep love for Northern Ireland, and I know you have a deep satisfaction that the leadership is taken over by the safest of safe hands who will progressively continue that legacy to take Northern Ireland forward. Many want to thank you uh, for running that race. You weren't a shepherd that followed the sheep, but you were a shepherd that was able to stay in sight of the leadership that Northern Ireland needed to take Northern Ireland uh, forward. Uh, you led to the primacy of politics, a peaceful Northern Ireland, an economically successful Northern Ireland, and more than anything, your legacy of excellence has defeated a previous maxim that all political careers end in failure. Thank you. And I call Mr. David McNary. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, a happy new year to you and uh, to all our colleagues. A fresh start indeed. Um, I was watching the, the BAFTAs for a short time, uh, a very short time last night. Uh, you, you know where the, the winners make the crummy speeches uh, and the losers grin with gritted teeth thinking it should have been me. Uh, I'm not looking in uh, any particular... I'm not looking uh, in any uh, particular direction, Speaker. Uh, it is for some to be careful what you might wish for. This afternoon I, I used the occasion uh, to wish the outgoing First Minister a very sincere good health, a good luck, and in Northern Ireland all the best. As First Minister, uh, Peter Robison uh, at all times was both courteous and respectful to myself and my UKIP party leader, Nigel Farage, uh, which I'm glad to say was mutually reciprocated. We grew up in politics together. Uh, he is, was, and I'm sure will remain a formidable opponent, and his progress by far uh, outstripped mine and most, if not all, of his contemporaries. Uh, as for advice, well, it's time to, to stop the fags, to ditch the booze, and cut out the late nights. Well, that's what you told me not so long ago. <laughs> and two out of three isn't too bad. R reality to, to Peter, if celebrity get me out of here comes knocking, just tell them that you've left the Stormont executive jungle. And uh, I think that you could say strictly looks more promising. Uh, as you've always said, it takes two to tango, and you've certainly proved that. Where we are, where we're going, uh, thanks to you, outgoing First Minister, we're still moving on to wherever that is. And your successor in a short time moves in. From your party perspective, you will be a hard act to follow. And so to Arlene Foster, you keep wish her well also in the role that she will have to address so very soon. Somehow, Peter, I'm sure it will be said often that you haven't gone away, you know. Whatever and wherever this journey takes you, Godspeed and walk tall, and thanks for what you've done for Northern Ireland. Thank you. Uh, I would advise the House uh, and uh, there were a number of people that I will recognise who didn't have the opportunity to contribute in this particular uh, point, but there will be uh, a further opportunity for members to speak when the next item of business has been concluded, and I will, uh, I, I will recognise those who didn't have the opportunity just now. So we move on.